This is a story I first heard from the telling of the late Thomas Cecil of Rathlin Island, a wonderful storyteller. Once long ago in Rathlin, a young boy called Jim lived with his family. He loved living on the island, he loved helping with the cows, and he would go out and lift the eggs when the hens laid out. But his favourite job was going to pick plump, juicy blackberries. His mother would make blackberry pie and blackberry jam. Now before he went out, she always gave him the same warning. She'd say to him, make sure you come home before dark. But the other thing she said was, don't go near the fairy tree. For people in Ireland know that you do not mess with the fairies. He went out in his old clothes, his old holy jumper, his patched trousers, and he was away all day. His mother thought she'd make his favourite dinner, champ. Flurry mashed potatoes, scallions chopped up, heat it in milk, we twist the butter, you know, some pepper. She'd already no sign of the boy. Jim! Jim! Her voice echoed all around her. He wasn't home and it was getting dark. She knocked on all her neighbours' doors. Have you seen my boy? Nobody had seen him. It was as if he'd just vanished. They searched until it was too dangerous to search anymore and at first night the next morning they were out again while the mother sat crying by the fireside. She was sure that her boy had maybe fallen off a cliff into the sea or maybe tripped and stumbled. For Rathlin Island is a beautiful place but a dangerous place at night if you're out walking. All the next day, all the next day she waited crying. The neighbours were out searching. But at supper time the next night she heard the door open, she heard the familiar footsteps on the quarry tile floor and there was her boy. Well, she didn't know whether to be cross with him or to hug him. And she hugged him and she said, where have you been? What happened to you? And when she took a better look, he was totally different. He had no holes in his trousers, no holes in his jumper. His clothes looked as though they were brand new. He was scrubbed even the back of his neck. His hair was gleaming and he said, oh, wait to tell you, mummy. I was coming home, and I was late, and I was coming past that old tree you call the fairy tree. And wasn't there a big bush full of blackberries? And I started picking the blackberries, but all of a sudden I felt myself get nipped and pinched, and I looked down, and there was a ring of wee people, no bigger than my knee, fairies. They grabbed me, they pulled me down under the fairy hill, they plunged me into a big bath of soapy water, scrubbed my face, scrubbed my hair, scrubbed my clothes, and fairy tailors stitched up all the holes and darns. Then his mother remembered a story her granny had told her. If the fairies ever capture a human boy or a human girl, and if inside one day they can clean them of every trace from this mortal world, they can keep them. But her boy was home safe and sound. She put him to bed, said their prayers. But half an hour later, he shouted, Mommy, and she ran in. He said, My finger's sore. When she looked, deep down under the nail on the middle finger of his right hand was a thorn from a blackberry bush. And those fairies, with all their scrubbing and all their cleaning, had somehow missed that tiny thorn. But it was just enough of a link to our world. So if you come to Ireland and you're out walking about and you scuff your shoes, you catch yourself in a branch, don't worry one thing about it. It's the thing that will make sure you'll get home and the fairies won't take you.
speaking to you from the ghost room in Ballygally Castle Hotel. And Ballygally Castle Hotel has the dubious reputation of being the most haunted hotel in the whole of Ireland. There are four, maybe five ghosts that sometimes can be seen late at night wandering the corridors and playing in the stairways. But I want to tell you about the most famous one. See, this house was built in 1625 by Sir James Shaw, a Scotchman, who came over from his native land just across the way and rented this domain off Lord Antrim. He had this house built with five feet thick walls to withstand cannon. He diverted a local stream to run under the house so that he could have fresh water if besieged. It seems they lived in strange times then too. And Sir James's wife, Lady Isabella, she is the most interesting person in this whole story because as Sir James's wife, her duty, seems her sole duty, was to produce a male heir. And when she became pregnant, of course, Sir James was delighted. When she gave birth to a baby daughter, he was incensed. Although it was rumoured that she was having a dalliance, shall we say, with a mariner. In any case, Sir James had her baby taken away from her and he locked her here in this room. It is said that she was hungered and demented by grief at the loss of her child and possibly the loss of her lover. She went mad in this room. She went out through one of these windows. And whether she tried to take her own life, whether she tried to escape, whether she fell accidentally or was murdered, perhaps we shall never know. What is certain is that she came to a violent end. And her restless spirit still walks the corridors here at night. And people who have stayed in this hotel report that they have seen her knocking doors in the corridors. She appears in rooms as if looking for something, perhaps her lost child. Some people say they have seen her looking out to sea, perhaps for her lover. But all who have seen her have said that they felt no fear. She presents no danger to anyone. Still, I wouldn't like to come to the ghost room in the middle of the night. So I'm standing here by the Glenarm River at the bottom of Glenarm Glen, which stretches for three miles behind me. And this is a story that was collected from Glenarm by Jack McBride in the 70s. And this telling owes much to him. A long time ago, but not so far from living memory, there was a woman lived up the glen. We'll call her Mary. And Mary had her own wee cottage. And out the back there was a byre with a cow. And in the yard there was a few hens. And Mary, well, she wasn't married. She lived on her own. But she had a special skill. In most villages and places in those days, there would be a woman who would assist all the local women when they were given birth. And Mary was one of those women. Sometimes they were called handy women. And that was a perfect name for Mary because she had strong but gentle hands. The perfect hands for bringing new souls into this world. Or sometimes helping the old ones pass on into the next. So Mary was used to being woken at all hours of the night when her services were required. And she was well respected and well liked. So it was no surprise to her when one dark stormy night an urgent knock came to her door. And when Mary took her little rushlight to see who it was, there was a young man standing there, no more than three foot tall, and his face ashen white. Please, Hurry, come, my wife needs you. She's in a lot of agony. 
Well, Mary didn't need to be asked twice. She went and got her basket of things and outside there was a coach waiting to take her further up the glen. She got into the coach and it was only after a little while she began to, to wonder why she couldn't hear the, the hooves of the horses travelling on the road. And although the carriage of the coach was comfortable enough, she felt a little bit imprisoned in it and a little bit of unease stirred in her stomach. When finally the coach stopped, Mary alighted down onto the ground and the young man stood there with a blindfold. He wanted to blindfold her and this alarmed her a little bit more. But she knew one thing. She knew that no violence was ever offered to a doctor or a midwife. And so she let him put the blindfold on and he took her by the hand and he led her through what seemed to be a cave because she could hear the water dropping down the wall. When finally they stopped and the blindfold came off, Mary was standing in front of a miniature castle with turrets and lights blazing on all the windows. And the young man took her in. And the place was silent except for one far room where she could hear the cries of a woman in some distress. When Mary entered the room, there was a young woman in the bed. She was crying, her brow was fevered. And Mary, with one of her strong, gentle hands, she put her hand on her brow and she calmed her. And she felt the baby in the woman's belly. Well, Mary had to work with the baby in the belly a lot before finally she delivered a little baby. And this was the smallest morsel of baby Mary had ever delivered. But the woman in the bed was no more than two foot tall. She cleaned the baby, she gave it to the woman. And then she went to gather her things together to leave. For by now, Mary had a good idea that she was in the land of fairy. But when she got to the door of that castle, the two little doorkeepers crossed their lances to stop her leaving. And the young man with the ashen face came running. You cannot leave now, he said. You must stay until the queen, my wife, is up and on her feet again. Well, Mary was in no position to refuse. But she knew one thing. She knew that she should not eat any food or drink anything that was offered to her from the fairy realm or they would be able to keep her there indefinitely. And so she said she would stay. But that food should be brought to her from her own glen in her own realm. Well, to this the young man agreed and he told her that her own cow and hens would be well looked after. And so she stayed on caring for the little bear and the mother. When the time came for her to leave, that morning the young man came and told her that she must never speak of what she had seen here to anyone. And he gave her a little jar of ointment to rub on the baby's head. Well, there she was, rubbing the baby's head with the ointment. When an itch came on her right eye and she lifted her finger to scratch it. The next thing Mary knew, she was back in her own wee cottage. And there on the dresser, there was a golden purse. And when she lifted up, it was full of gold coins. And when she went out into the yard to check on her hens and look for her cow, she discovered that the number of hens was double what it had been. And in the byre there were two cows where there had been one. She had indeed been well rewarded for her services. And she wondered if it had really happened or been a dream. But then when the neighbours asked her if the lovely dumb girl that had looked after the place while she was gone was some relation, she realised that she really had been away. Well, a few days later, Mary took the little purse and she took out a few coins to go into Glenorm village to the shop on the village street to buy herself a few treats. And she went into the shop and what did she see? 
but two wee fairy folk with baskets over their arms, helping themselves to all and sundry, and the shopkeeper seeming not to see anything. Indignantly she said, Are you stealing? Well, the wee fairy folk, they looked up at her. Can you see us? Surely I can, with my own eyes. One of them said, With both eyes. And Mary held a hand up to each eye in turn. No, she said, only with my right eye. Well, that's lucky for you, said one of the wee fairy man, and he jumped up and he gave her such a blow in the eye that she stepped back. And that was the last that Mary would ever see out of that eye. And when she made her way up the glen to her own wee cottage, there was but one cow where there had been two, and the original number of hens was back to what it had been. And when she went inside, the golden purse was empty. All she was left with was a couple of coins she'd put in her apron pocket, which is what she would normally have received for her services. But on the table there was a note, and the note said, when a blind man has his sight restored, your goal shall be found up in Strayed Killy, which is just a couple of miles up the road from here. Well, after that, Mary, she died a poor old woman, for what use is a midwife with just one eye? And that's the story they tell. And as far as I know, that fairy gold has never been found, though many's a one has been up strayed killy, searching for it. I'm Stephen O'Hara and I'm here today to tell a story about the beautiful Loch Arima. And Loch Arima is Ireland's vanishing lake. Now, the reason it vanishes is because the lake has a stream that runs through it. And as the stream flows and water builds up, it blocks the exit of the water and it fills up with water. So you could go across the mountain in the morning and the lake could be full and you could go back in a few hours in the evening and the lake will have drained again as it is at the minute. And it's a very eerie sort of place here. Um, on a beautiful morning like today, you wouldn't think it, but there's quite a lot of tragedy associated with Loch Arima. And the story that I'm going to tell you about concerns uh, Colonel John McGee McNeil, who was retired British Army officer from the Royal Engineers and he had family in Cushendon, he lived in Ballycastle and he had been staying with his cousin Captain Dan McNeil and he was going to Ballycastle on the 30th of September 1898 to catch the 3pm train and it had been raining heavily for three days and three nights and the lake was full to the brim and at that time the road used to be much lower than it is today and the lake had actually spilled out across the road and had submerged the road. Now, as he approached in a carriage with his driver, the driver decided that he was going to force the horses on through the water. They didn't realize just how deep it was. And they plowed into four feet of water and the cold of the water when it reached the horses' bellies made the horses shy and rear up. And the driver took his horse whip and he struck the horse on the left and that caused it to turn rapidly and violently into the horse on the right. And the two horses turned the carriage over and they dragged it down over the hill here and down into the lake, into 20 feet of water. Now, Colonel McNeil was wearing a heavy gabardine overcoat. And as he was thrown from the carriage, the water just soaked into his coat and it acted like an anchor and it pulled him down into the water. Now, nearby, there was a witness. There was a a man named McHenry who was a road worker and he had seen the accident happen and he grabbed a stick and he ran to the water's edge. He couldn't swim, he couldn't go in and render aid like that and he reached the stick into the water and he encouraged Colonel McNeil to swim towards him and Colonel McNeil was a strong swimmer. He was a man of 61 but he was in good health and he swam to within a couple of yards of the water's edge and he almost reached the stick but the water just pulled him under and he was drowned and his driver was drowned, and the horses were drowned, and there was a report in the Reading Mercury of the inquest just a couple of weeks later, and the witness, McHenry, gave evidence, and he said that the horses had pranced into the water, and he said, he described uh, 
his dismay at not being able to save Colonel John. Now, it's an idyllic place in daytime, in dry weather, but I can tell you, having lived here all my life, this is an eerie and spooky place at night or during a sn snowstorm or in rainfall. And there's something about the acoustics in the road that the hills on each side, the peat hills, just soak up all the sound. And you can hear your own footsteps as you walk through. And people say that at night, if they're traveling and the, if the rain is, has been heavy and the, the lake is full, they say that they can hear the sound of horses whinny and against the hillsides and reverberating down the glen. And that's the story of Colonel John McNeil. He's not the only person to have died here. There was a bred man from Ballycastle, from Ballavoy actually, there was, there was a bred man from Ballavoy, which is just three miles from here, and he was delivering bread to Cushion Dunn. This is about 20 years after Captain This is about 20 years after. If you start just from the, there was a bread man. There was a bread man whose name was Dan Scullion. And Dan lived in Balavoy, just about three miles from here. And he was delivering bread over the mountain to Cushion Dunn during very heavy snowfall. And at the last house on his route, the housewife pleaded with him not to risk the mountain in such bad weather, to spend the night and maybe the snow would be better in the morning. But he wanted home to his mother and he ignored her pleadings and he took his bread cart over the mountain and when he got to here he never made it home. Now his body was not found for four days. The snow was so heavy and his cart had been overcome by snow and it was almost compacted and buried into a snowbank. Four days later after the whole community was out searching for him they found his remains here at Locarima. The weather was that bad at that time that the, the cattle market in Armoy had taken place and farmers reported having to find their way home in the snow by dismounting from their horses and holding their horses' tails and allowing the horse to lead them through the snow. So it was a particularly bad year of snow. There was one other incident which concerns a doctor who was called from Ballycastle to go to Cushendall to a lady who was in labour and having difficulties. And he rode to Cushendall uh, uh, on a dog cart. It was a, it's a very small cart with a single horse. And when he examined the woman, he decided she needed to be hospitalised. So they put her in the cart and he headed off. And again, it had been raining particularly heavily, but the, the lake hadn't broken across the road. But when he reached here, his horse stumbled and it became a bit lame, one of its legs. Uh, was not functioning properly and he pulled over to the side of the road and he was frantic worrying about how to get the woman to the hospital when a, he spied a house nearby and he went to the door of the house and he asked for help and an old man came out and he said sure and he took him into his little stable and he had a pony and he came out and they swapped the horses over and tied the slightly lame horse on behind the cart and he headed off towards Ballycastle but after a couple of minutes the doctor said here this is not the right road to Ballycastle. And the old man said, well, it's the only road I know to Ballycastle. And in actual fact, where he was taking him was over the mountain, away in that direction, which was the road to Ballycastle before the road was built in 1842. There's a road here which we know as the Green Road, and it, you can still see the imprint of the road across the hill. And he led him into Ballycastle that way. Anyhow, they got to the hospital, the baby was safely delivered. The doctor went outside and the old old man was gone. And, but his pony was still there, and so the doctor walked home with his pony and his own horse and his cart, and he stabled them. And in the morning when he went out, there was no pony there, only his own horse. And he went back to the hospital and he said, did any of you see the old man who helped me out last night? And they said, there was no old man. And he said, he, he lives in a wee house near Locarima. He said, there's no house near Locarima. And he said, and he took me over an unfamiliar road. And he said, that road hasn't been used for decades. So the story goes that there was, in fact, a magic pony and that the man had helped out the, 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 man had helped out the doctor and the lady in her time of need. And there was a, there's an additional local legend about that man who is reputed to live here. 
and that is that he only helps when a child is about to be born and he will appear and he will come and offer aid but that he only does it when the child to be born is going to be a great doctor and history tells us that the baby that was born that night in fact went on to become one of the top surgeons in the Royal Hospital in Belfast. So we've got three very kind of spooky legends attached to the place and I can assure you as you come through here at night or if you're on your own you feel like pulling your coat a bit more tightly around yourself and you're paying more attention to the sounds that you can hear and you're always cautious for Colonel John McNeil or the Magic Pony or Dan Scullion. Those are the stories connected with Locarima. Once there was a little girl. She was a shepherdess and she looked after sheep. But one day she lost one of her sheep and so she went walking into the nearby forest to see if it was there. And as she walked, she picked bits of wool from the branches of trees and bushes and she was spinning them on her fingers as she went. But after a while of searching, she got tired and so she leant herself against a tree. She thought it was a birch tree and she rested. But as she leant against the tree, she thought she felt it sway and move against her. And when she looked up, she thought she saw a face in that tree, a wooden face with bark for skin. And it smiled at her, it was like a lady's face. But she was scared, and so she went to jump away. And the tree spoke to her. The birch face spoke. It said, child, stay. Don't run away. Let me look at your little feet so pretty and sweet. Imagine what it's like for me. I'm rooted deep in the ground. I cannot dance or move around. So dance for me, child, just for a while. Well, what would you do? Would you dance for a tree? The girl, she thought, surely there's no harm in dancing just a little. And so she went around the tree. Once, twice, she began to skip and trip lightly around the tree until one time a branch came down and it caught her and it gripped her tight. And then the tree began to tremble and quicken and it heaved itself out of the ground and it began to dance with her round and round, wilder and wilder, faster and faster. The girl and the tree, they danced all day. The light faded and still they danced. They danced so much that the shepherdess was completely out of breath and she had to cry out finally, please stop, my feet are so sore, I can't dance anymore. But still the tree swung her round and round and they danced and danced until she was quite near despair, thinking that that tree just didn't care until finally it flung her up in the air and caught her again and cradled her in its branches and then the tree laid her back down against its trunk and settled itself back into the ground and the little girl wondered was that all a dream? And she looked up and the face was still there in the trunk and it seemed to smile at her. And then she heard the words, child, thank you. Now I have dances to dream in my sleep and memories I'll always keep. Your sheep is found, your wool is spun, good luck's to come. Now take some leaves to remember me and the time you danced with a tree. And the little girl, she bobbed a curtsy to the tree and she took her apron and she filled it with leaves from the ground. And there on the path was her sheep and she began to walk home. But as she walked, her apron seemed to be heavier and heavier. How could leaves be so heavy? 
And as she was walking along the road, it was like she was bent double by the load, until finally the leaves came tumbling out with a ring clink clink, and what do you think? The leaves were solid silver, every one, and the poor days of that little shepherdess were done. And as she went walking home that day, her heart was light, and she thought she heard a, a leafy laugh following her along the path. In the year 1712, a journey through the glens of Antrim was a dangerous undertaking. There was no coast road then, just a rough track, and the braes were thickly wooded, and an unwary traveller could become easily lost. And then among the holly and the birch and the rowan and the oak there lurked ghosts. There were bands of cutthroat robbers, herds of wild boar and packs of wolves. There was a brave man or a full hardy one who would venture into the glens of Antrim alone. But a certain priest prayed for divine protection and mounted on a pony he set out from his native parish on the north coast down through the glens of Antrim on a pilgrimage heading for the burial shrine of St Patrick in the county down and as he approached the village of Carnlock the road swept up the hill towards Knappen Mountain and about a mile's distance he could see up ahead that the road forked and when he reached the fork in the road, his little pony stopped dead in its tracks. He tried to spur it on to the left-hand path and back down to the shore, but it refused. He tried again, and it refused again. He was about to flog the animal when they heard the bone-chilling sound of a howling wolf. Pony didn't wait for his master. He took the right hand path and headed up towards Knappen Mountain. They hadn't gone very far when what stepped out of the undergrowth but a great grey Irish wolf with a massive head and wild green eyes. There was nowhere to go. The wolf came down the track towards them. The pony reared up, almost dismounting its rider. And then the priest heard a voice, Whoa, whoa there. And the pony settled. The priest looked around to see where the voice had come from, but he could see no one. And when he looked again, the wolf was six feet in front of him. Fear not, father, said the wolf. All is not what it seems. Be gone. Satan, said the priest, what trickery is this? Father, fear not. I am no wolf and I'm no devil. Then in the name of God, what are you, said the priest? I am a man in wolf's clothing. Many years ago, my people had a curse placed on them. And every seven years since then, a man and a woman from my people have been cast out to wander the land in the form of wolves. If they survive, they may return to their people, bearing in mind that one year as a wolf is seven years as a man. They may return and die in their own beds. And if they do not survive, said the priest, in over 1,200 years it has never happened that both the man and the woman have perished, but... When that happens, a curse will be lifted. And what do you want of a poor cleric like me? Said the priest. My partner in this curse is dying. She is my beloved wife, Father. It is her wish that in her final hours she receive the holy sacrament of the last rites. Do this, and I give you my word, 
I will lead you back to safety and you may carry on with your journey. And if I refuse, said the priest. The wolf looked up to the darkening sky and said, Time is short, fella. Follow me. Well, the priest had no option. He followed on behind the wolf and it eventually led him to a mighty oak tree, the bowl of which had been hollowed out. And inside there lay a she-wolf. When the priest entered, she opened her eyes. And one big tear ran down the fur of her muzzle and into the earth. The priest began the ceremony of the last rites. Right up until the point of the last communion. And when he faltered, the she-wolf begged him to complete his duty and give her the viaticum. He demurred and said, I do not have it with me. At that, the man-wolf's hackles raised on his back and he snarled his teeth and said, Father, you forget yourself. The host is in a leather pouch about your neck. And with his hand trembling, the priest gave the she-wolf the last communion. And she took it as any Christian would have, woman would have done on her deathbed. And the priest and the two wolves spent what was left of that short night inside the oak tree. But the priest never slept a wink. And he was sure he would be devoured at any moment. Just before dawn, the she-wolf breathed her last. And her mate, the man-wolf, lifted his mighty head and howled for a long time. Even in his terror, the priest felt some pity for the beast. And eventually, the man-wolf gathered himself and he led the priest through the woods, up over Napan Mountain, across the heather, until he came to a ravine where a burn called a cranny flowed down from the plateau and they followed it down past a waterfall. And when they came to the pool at the foot of Cranny Falls, the wolf said, I must rest here, Father. I have kept my word. Follow the stream down to the shore and you will come to the village of Carnloch where you will be safe. And the priest solemnly blessed the wolf. In nomine Patri, Phile, Spiritus Sancti, Amen. And he mounted his pony and he rode off as fast as he could, always looking over his shoulder, for he was sure the moment his back was turned that he would be attacked. And when he looked back, he saw that the wolf was lying beside the pool at the foot of Cranny Falls. And when he got to the village, he told everyone that he had been attacked by this fearsome wolf and where he had last seen it. And a group of men banded together with cudgels and a musket. And with a mighty hound straining on the leash, they went up the track to Cranny Falls, where they found the wolf, as the priest had said. Is it sleeping? One of them said. And the man with the musket lifted it and cocked his weapon and poof, fired a ball into its side. And the wolf gave one last mighty sigh. And a 1200 year old curse was lifted. They lifted its body and carried it down to the village in triumph for the people to view in wonderment and fear and to collect their bounty of five shillings. And that was the last time a native Irish wolf was ever heard tell of in the glens of Antrim. And as for the priest, no one recorded his name.